Hi, this is Janos, it's Real World Audio. Today is going to be a very special episode because I'm going to share uh, why I chose to build my void pipe and also answering a specific question on how I chose the measurements for my void pipes, the actual dimensions. So what did I base them on? And, uh, and I'm going to show you what I based my measurements on. So basically, I based it on Derek Walton's void pipe and I adjusted a little bit because he used an Odex driver and I had a Fostex driver. And I did a little adjustment based on the difference of the VAS values uh, between the drivers. Uh, today I would not go with that. Uh, just remember, this was my very first speaker that I built, very first DIY loudspeaker. I built it before I met my mentor. I was a completely greenhorn at the time when I did that. And I just made that assumption, reading forums and, and TLS small parameters and everything, you know, getting into that thinking, that type of thinking, that based the TS parameters are the response to everything, which they are not. But at that time, that's what I thought. And, and I thought that as that pipe worked very well for him with that driver, I had no access to that driver, but I had access to a different one. And um, they were close enough in parameters to each other. And I thought that it will be beneficial if I just do a little resizing. So I resized the, the height and the depth of the pipe by adjusting it to uh, a difference in total volume, internal volume of the cabinet, which is equivalent to the difference in the VAS parameters of the driver. And I kept the width of the cabinet the same because that's fixed by the driver size. Uh, the angle of the, of the backside remained the same as Derek Walton's. And, and the ratio where the driver sits in the front of the cabinet that also remain the same. And uh, there will be two more details that I'm going to show later on. But now I will do something really special because I have found Derek Walton's void pipe. Now the thing is that uh, normally you cannot do that because uh, the site is no longer available but I did some detective work. So now I'm going to show you guys how I did this detective work because it might be helpful for you to access sites that are not available anymore. And with void pipes, this might be especially useful because uh, back then around year 2000, there was a billion websites on void pipes, just an amazing number of resources and now all of them are gone. So, so uh, I think like two years ago, I wanted to do a void pipe review series on the websites that, that I used to, to look at uh, information on them. And, and that's when I found out that almost none of them are alive, even two years ago, which also means today, yeah. So this is what I did. I just typed into Google, Derek Walton void pipe because that's his name, the builder's name and void pipe. And then look what it did. It also said void pipe with an H in it because a lot of people write void pipes with, with an H, but that is incorrect. The designer's name was Paul Voigt, like, like uh, the way I spelled it, no H in it. But, but pe pe people usually uh, put H so it, it kind of it, it became a, a standard. So if, if you use this or, or without H, people know that is the same thing you are talking about. But this is the correct uh, wording because it was Paul Voigt without an H. And, and of course, you can't find anything about it. And uh, however, you find like people, if you, I clicked on it and there was another link, some people talking about Derek Walton. So there was one, some person reported that they built 
point by based on a recommendation of someone building it uh, on Derek Walton's uh, void pipe, but it doesn't mention anything about it. And also he mentioned that he, he changed the length a lot, but uh, that's it, so that doesn't help us. I found also a reference in uh, Audio Asylum, and he said like, the website is gone, that was in 2005 already, and then Derek Walton replied to him that I'm here, and, uh, and let's see that link. There you go. He says, that's where my website is. But, but by now, when I went to that link, it's gone. It doesn't exist anymore. So what did I do? I typed into Google, old websites, backup, mirror, time machine. So I want to find, there are also some big time machine uh, website mirrors, and then you can type in, old email addresses, I mean website addresses, and it will get you a mirror, a backup of, of sites. So I clicked on the first result that came in, and then I typed in, copied in that uh, email address, I mean not email, the web address, and it gave me uh, different selections of different time points, and I clicked on one of them, and there you go, Derek Walton's website or at least a, a version that was saved at, at a specific time point in, in 2007, last day of the year. That was when it was backed up by this server service thing. And as you see, he has multiple entries there. You can click on any of them and, and it is under void pipes. And I actually found his website. This was in year 2001. <laughs> when I was looking at it, because uh, I knew about 300B2 BAMPs and I wanted to build my, my, for myself a 300B2 BAMP. So I was looking for 300B designs and I found the Joseph S. Miller 300B schematics and, and his version of it, and Derek Walton built a 300, that Joseph S. Miller 300B, and there you go the first version, second and third, at the time when I looked in 2001, I think he was down to the first version yet, so, so these were new, I haven't even seen myself these. But basically, uh, his uh, description of it is, uh, is one of the best descriptions of how you can build a, a, an amplifier for yourself if that's your first build. And uh, if you want to build something else, still I recommend uh, reading these because it's excellent advice for first-time builders. And, uh, and also for me it kind of made me realize that the, the cost of building a 300B amp is uh, beyond my budget, so I decided to go something else, but what I found was the void pipe description. Uh, and, uh, and he described here that the void pipes are an amazing match for the 300B amplifier. And even 25 years ago, or 22 years ago, when I was a, a, a totally green about DIY and building equipment and, and loads of things about stereo, but even back then I knew about equipment synergy and how important it is. And if you are new to this concept, this is the most important aspect of how to mix and match audio gear is to mix and match gear that has synergy. You don't want the best amplifier and mix it with the best speakers because if there is no synergy with them, maybe they are antagonistic, it will sound like crap. It won't sound good. It won't sound anything that you want in your room for yourself. What you need to find is something that you love. Either you have like a, a, an amplifier kind that, that you that, that you are in love with, or you have a speaker that you are in love with, or a speaker type, and then you need to find the, the, the matching partner that synergizes with your favorite choice. And that will get you to your audio nirvana. And this is what Derek Walton did for me, is that he found the void pipes to be an astonishing match for 300B amplifier. And then I knew that, okay, I'm going to look into this void pipe. 
and actually by that time I, I was looking into void pipes already because it's one of the cheapest ways to start building speakers for first-time speaker builders but he was the one who really elevated the concept of void pipe for me that it's not just like a beginner's project and and it's something to to get your feet wet and then you can go for a more complicated uh, build that will be better but but something that is potentially your last speaker and you won't need anything more and uh, what you will need if you have a good void pipe is just work on your amplifier to improve your amp because uh, the void pipe will be able to hold its pace as, as, you, as you improve your, your amplifier, as you improve your sources, your cabling, etc. The exact same void pipe will be, uh, how it presents sound will be transformed and it will just grow with it and you don't have to keep on changing the speakers. And essentially my void pipe is almost unchanged compared to how it was 22 years ago. The only change I did in it was to change the driver and I did it as a must because the surround of the old driver rotted out. And that's not speaking of, uh, of the quality of Fostex, but it's because here in Hawaii everything rots. And something that would last 50 years in Japan or, or uh, 80 years in Paris here is dead in 10 years so that it lasted here 20 years it's just amazing so so Fostex did a, a fantastic job with that surround it is not a plastic surround it was a cloth surround in that driver it was a super nice driver and um, anyway so going back let's let's click on uh, that uh, uh, that's not it that's not it uh, <laughs> I clicked another link on his site as well but this is when we click on the void pipe link uh, this is what we get and 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 he describes here that he built the void pipe as a joke he thought he was convinced that this is going to be a joke because like everyone else he was also used to you know if you want good sound you need multiple drivers it has to be complex drivers uh, some uh, crossover whatever work on it to sound good and 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 just the concept that a single driver in a box or, or a cabinet like a weird cabinet like this can sound like anything more than a joke is, is it doesn't sound plausible right and um, and and then he says the joke was on me to say that i was shocked would be an understatement but i went to bed dreaming of the music i just heard and um, and that's, that was my impression as well after I built my pipe. Uh, my jaw was just hanging like, oh my God, this is just absolutely transformational compared to anything that I, I, I expected to hear in my room, given my skills and my budget and my expectations. And it, it, it went far beyond anything I, I imagined that this will bring to me based on the resources that I put in in it. Of course, if you have something like a $50,000 speakers or something, then uh, I, I think y you will have a hard time. If, if you really love it, it has great synergy with your system, then uh, th this might not drop your jaw, but uh, compared to the money you put in it, it's, 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 it's a really astonishing experience. Uh, and. Uh, so what he did is that, um, uh, anyway, I don't want to read it out aloud, but um, maybe I should. And uh, here he emph emphasizes uh, that the, most of the music that you hear, about over 90% is in the mid-range, like 250 hertz to 2 kilohertz. That's the absolute majority of the music. Anything below 250 hertz or above 3 kilohertz is marginal and just like a decoration on the cake. And, uh, and I, I need to add to this observation that it's not just the content of the music is mostly there, 
but also that 80% of your brain's processing power is also in this same region. <laughs> so most of the music is there and most of your brains is trained to process that region. And as audiophiles, we have retrained our brains to neglect this range of, uh, of the sound spectrum and refocused on the bass and refocused on the highs. And I think that is why most of us are not happy with the system choices we have, how, how our, our, our gears don't sound the way we want and we don't know why. But that's the reason why. Because we are obsessed, critically and clinically obsessed with bass and, and with the uh, highs and there is no awareness about the mid-range and just think about it how many expressions and terms we have on describing bass on describing the high frequencies it's like all the media and magazines and reviews are just overflowing with these expressions and about the mid-range there's almost nothing <laughs> because it's 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 given. We we think it's something normal, right? Uh, but but that's where the majority of the music lives. That's where your brain puts most of its subconscious effort, subconscious to you, effort to process music. And as as Derek points out here, that if you have a crossover in this region, uh, for your brain it's going to be broken presented as, as a broken, uh, which, which might not trigger your audiophile sensibilities, but subconsciously it will not make a natural unified sound and something will bug you subconsciously that there's something wrong with the music because it's crossed over in this range. And, and some of you might say, oh no, but I put DSP on it and, and I measured it and everything. And no, you can't. What you did is align up certain parameters at a certain specific listening position. You move your ears here, there, that alignment is gone. It's gone. All the measurements you do for time alignment, for driver's alignment, it depends on the 3D position of the listener. And if you move out just a few inches from that position, then it, that alignment will be gone. Except when it's coming from a single driver. Then that alignment will hold even if you go uh, move around in your room. And I'm not saying that every single driver uh, uh, can do this to the same extent and they are not all equal. They are just as big differences between two single drivers and single driver speakers as there are between multi-driver speakers or open baffles or pa panels or horns. Just think about how different is one horn speaker from another horn speaker. That's how different a single driver speaker is from another single driver speaker. And, uh, and let's see.